like held my truck hostage come to find out that like i think he was on drugs or something oh, i drove yeah. to Sioux and owning a tacoma and owning one of these these are so much better than a third gen tacoma dude oh. ship your 80 to me tell me what you want we'll design a bumper i was like done Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. You have arrived at episode number 10. John, we are in double digits. Number I know. It, feel, it feels like we're actually doing this thing. It's kind of crazy. <laughs> it's like a becoming a habit. You know, uh, when John and I first had this idea a year or so ago, uh, I think we had a, a number. We said like 20 episodes. We were going to do it every week and stick to this schedule. And it was going to be consistent because you had to do it consistently uh and then we didn't uh now granted mm -hmm. we had real life factors that, yeah. that caused that but uh but <laughs> yeah we're, we're we're back in it um john there's a uh before we get to our guest uh there's a reel that uh i've saw pop up a few places let me show you this check this thing out <laughs> this is a four-wheel drive corolla uh wagon obviously this is an Australian guy. His name is Ricky Tan. You can check out his Instagram. Uh, but he's got a whole build thread for this thing. And these are real. It was an AE95 is the spec. Uh, and they have a center diff lock. They don't have a low range. But they're a real four-wheel drive uh, vehicle. Hmm. And, uh, man, I just love stuff like that. Like, it's just, it's just fun, right? Like, you know... Um, it's a, it's a true budget build. I encourage people to go check it out, read through the thread. I love these kind of oddball, <laughs> you know, vehicles that uh, that you don't see on the road every day. And he built a lot of the parts himself. I mean, just, you know, put, put some coil spacers in it and change the uh, springs in the back. And then you're out there having fun. So that's awesome. Yeah. It makes me want to build out the RAV4. Well, you know, they and they share parts. I went down this whole rabbit hole on that, but there's uh, like, it uses the, the same CVs uh, from hmm. the RAV4. Obviously there was that later uh, Toyota uh, Tercel, the, the four wheel drive one. So it's got similarity to that. Uh, and it used uh, 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 one of the Toyota guys is going to get mad at me. Uh, uh, they <laughs> didn't call it, true. they didn't call it a track at the time. It was called a, a something else track. Uh, it was kind of the predecessor uh, to a track and they even had them, with hmm. uh, uh, adjustable height suspension, oh, sound familiar? Yeah, it does yeah. So there's That's your sweet. there's your tidbit for the day. Uh, Corolla wagons, four wheel drive. All right, uh, our guest tonight uh, does not have a Corolla wagon, to my knowledge, uh, <laughs> but he he has had uh, many other vehicles that he has documented through his uh, Instagram handle, which is Black Hills Builds. Welcome to the show, Mr. Wes Erickson. Hey, Wes. Hey, yeah, thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be on the show. Absolutely, welcome, man. Welcome. This is uh, this this is fun. Uh, you don't have any any Corolla wagons, do you? I would love. I seeing that thing made me a little jealous. Not gonna lie, I think I was right? just ending it. Um, yeah, I don't have any Corolla wagons. I've, I've driven plenty of Corollas, but none that capable. <laughs> The 35 mile per gallon girl is not the yeah. uh, my sister. Three and had, half. <laughs> yeah, she had a, a six speed. I, was, I think it was a maybe it was a five speed, but it was like a 2004 Corolla, is what I learned how to drive manual on back in the day. Yeah. So my Excellent. sister actually taught me how to drive stick shift, and it was in a, a black Corolla. Perfect yeah. vehicle to learn stick on. It is. Yeah. Oh, it, you could abuse those clutches <laughs> so much, like you couldn't kill one. Yeah. It, it's I funny. <laughs> I think like three or four years after she taught me new clutch and flywheel went in that thing. So I was always just in the back of my mind. I'm like, I wonder was what, what was that me? But no, they are bomb proof. That's for sure. <laughs> so uh, unless you've, uh, you've been under a rock, if you're on Instagram, you have probably seen uh, if, if you don't follow Wes, but if you have any type of, off-road or overlanding related account, I almost guarantee you one of his reels has popped up in your your feed at some time. Uh, your first reel, I think, was back, uh, actually, I've got a picture of 
your very first post here, not a reel, but a post. Yeah. Because in the beginning, you were posting a lot of photos before there was any videos. Yeah, I was kind of like on the cusp right before Instagram Reels even became a thing. And I'm back right. in, what was it, like 2019, I think? 2019, November 26, 2019. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so a long time ago. Um, <laughs> that was actually a buddy's camera. So I didn't even take that picture. That was before I even bought a nice camera setup and was just like, hey, I should make an account, see what kind of people I can meet. And um, yeah, it was a long time ago. Jeez. So, so that was then uh, five years ago. Uh, at the time, it was uh, Black Hills Taco, correct? Yep. Yeah. Correct. So he documents his uh, his taco build, which we're going to walk through that here in a second. Uh, but you went from uh, zero followers, like we all do, to a hundred thousand plus uh, today. Yep. Yep. I don't, and I don't know the exact number, but it's it's right over a hundred somewhere. Yeah. Um, so. If you, th there's a lot of things to discuss in this episode. Uh, Wes has got a new company, Adventure Driven Media Co., uh, and we'll talk about how his personal Instagram experience has influenced that and his uh, career up until this point and kind of how it's all evolved. Uh, but I think what I want to do first, guys, is we're going to walk through each one of these builds, and Wes just kind of lets you uh, walk us through the journey on each one because there's been five different trucks that have kind of, uh, some of them have come and stayed, some of them have come and gone. Yeah. on your on your account some of them stayed longer than others uh, yeah, some went one, in, one in particular went pretty quick yeah uh, but it all started with uh with the tacoma here we saw this this first picture so what did this thing look like when you got it so i bought this it was a 2018 it had like eighteen thousand miles on it i bought it used for like 28 grand back when you could get a used taco for like a pretty solid price it was a trd off-road um it already had like a leveling kit and 33s on it. Okay. Um, so it, it had a decent suspension set up right when I got it used from the dealership. And that kind of catapulted this whole journey into off-road and overland for me. Um, you look I a little had, different than five years yeah, ago. Yeah, I look good. What, you <laughs> don't pull that up. Get rid of that. Um, geez, what happened? Now I lost it. I don't even know where I was at anymore, guys. Um, it was like when I had one kid. So <laughs> moving out, moving out to the Black Hills, um, grew, grew up in Nebraska, moving out in the Black Hills, got into hunting, you know, tons of hiking and just embraced the outdoor scenery. Western South Dakota is beautiful. Mm -hmm. And um, I wanted to get a truck where I could still hunt and do different hobbies of mine and utilize it in those scenarios. But just adventure. There's a great trail system in the hills. And a Tacoma was kind of always my dream truck. So that's what I landed on. Um, and it quickly evolved into me being influenced by other creators on social media and people on YouTube to, wow, these things have a lot of aftermarket support. And I went nuts. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I documented it all from day one since I, I got it. Um, I immediately started hitting some of the, the more modest trails in the hills, I guess. And I went through what I would call a typical influencer IG progression of the truck right like it in every stage it was overbuilt for a while for what i needed um i got 33s and a really nice suspension set up i think i had like bp 51s oh nice AR, arb suspension i loved it that stayed on the truck for a long time um several different front and rear bumper setups on there was sso's front bumper ath fabs rear um I ended up wrapping the truck. Yeah, it, yeah, changed, so it changed color on me. Here, it changed dude. color, yeah. A couple of times. So that's actually a, a, another rabbit hole we don't need to go down. But I I had someone in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, wrap my truck, and he had it for about a month and, like, held my truck hostage, come to find out that, like, I think he was on drugs or something. Oh, I drove God. to Sioux Falls to get it, that right there, wrapped in brown, and – couldn't get in, couldn't get a hold of him. Like my truck was literally locked up. So I remember I rented a rental car to come all the way back home because I had gotten dropped off to pick my truck up. And I went back to get it like three days later. And luckily someone was at his shop and let me in and I just took it. It was half wrapped. It Holy was cow. like, yeah, not done. So I had to find another shop like a couple miles away because like 
weather stripping wasn't on it, you know, like it wasn't really drivable. And it was a whole like credit card processing. Like I put a claim in, luckily I got reimbursed, but hard lessons learned for wrapping the truck. <laughs> and and the second company did not do a good job, which is why that brown wrap was only on there for a couple months. And luckily Jake, Lucid Wraps, I'm sure you guys have all heard of him. He's amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, we have a great relationship. He's one of my close buddies now, but that's who wrapped the truck green like that. So, wow. um, yeah, that was a wild ride, but this stage of the truck was fun. It drove nice. It was re-geared, um, on like a 33 or 34 inch tire. And this is when I started getting into more, I w- I guess you consider like moderate trails in the Hills, like actually tagging the sliders a little bit, getting more comfortable with driving, um, taking some trips out of state to go to some random places. Um, but I would still say this truck's pretty overbuilt for what I was using it for at the time. Um, as the journey kept progressing and I kept upgrading the truck, I kept hitting harder trails in the hills and um, kind of pushing my boundaries and my limits a little bit, which was fun. But yeah, the Black, Black Hills Taco is what the, the page used to be. But this, a, I mean, I, the truck looked a, really nice at the yeah. stage. I was going to say, that's a damn good looking truck. I love yeah. that color. Yeah, it did look look really nice. So that's kind of how it, it finished out, right? In that, uh, yeah, stayed that color. Yep. And this then got on a little more aggressive trail. Yeah. So I started working with C4 Fabrication, which is, you know, local company to me in the hills. And, hmm. um, they filmed some install videos with some of their um, armor on my truck, which is why I'm, I have a C4 front there. Um, you'll see eventually I switched to their rear bumper too, prior to like going and actually working for them. So there's the C4 rear. And at this stage, had a camper on the truck. That was kind of the the last stage of the Tacoma. Um, was hitting some some more technical trails in the hills, having a blast. The truck was on 35s. Um, I was actually in the process of transitioning to work for C4 full time at this stage. Um, And that's kind of what spawned me selling the truck is I just wanted to pay cash for something that I could build that was a little bit more capable. Um, We have a lot of really great trails in the hills that I wouldn't have taken the Tacoma on just with the wheelbase and Mm -hmm. its capabilities. So I had kind of position myself to if i'm going to pivot what should i pivot to and that's kind of what what brought up the next build so oh. there she is so i got an 80 series land cruiser um i knew i wanted something toyota still i i loved land cruisers you know through the journey of the tacoma i had followed a lot of people that had built 80s and 60s and um i decided an 80 was kind of the perfect middle ground of some modern creature comforts that would be great for my family, but still super capable, solid axles, um, coil spring suspension. Um, so yeah, I looked a long time before I found a clean land cruiser and I got that one in California. Hmm. Um, I I wanted one that's there's California (laughs) tags on there. Yeah. 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 I wanted one that didn't have any rust. Um, I got super lucky and I still talk to the former owner to this day about random things, but I got, you can see what is that? Can't, can't point with the orientation of the camera. That's like the original window sticker. I got a binder of of maintenance records and he had gone through and done the head gasket and so much baselining and front and rear diff maintenance. And um, it was pretty much all OEM. I think there was like a, a one inch, suspension lift on there but everything else was factory other than the bumpers and it was just really really well taken care of so i knew from the get-go with the 80 what i wanted to do with it i wanted to wheel harder trails so i i didn't want to make the mistake of going through three different tire sizes on the 80 so i jumped straight to (laughs) straight to 37s i had already done a ton of research on on good suspension setups and i went with Dobinson's MRR suspension, which is what I ended the Tacoma on. And I really loved it. So I had known going into this kind of everything I wanted to get. And I actually had wheels and tires and suspension sitting in my garage before the Land Cruiser ever landed in South Dakota. Um, wow. So within like, I think that was within like two weeks of having the eight. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was quick. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. 
So I immediately, you know, started running some trails out in South Dakota and um, it looked really good at this stage. Now, now this is the first set of, of famous stripes. Uh, is that correct on here? Yeah, I knew I, I didn't want to do a full wrap, but I didn't want it plain white. And I looked and looked on what I wanted to do for a decal. And I saw some pictures of some old school 60 series cruisers that kind of had similar decals. And I sent them over to Jake and he's like, yeah, we could get something like that printed. And we kind of just retroed it on to the 80. Um, the front fender flare is a little bit more curved on the 80, but he was able to kind of cut it to a line and tuck the line right up under the door handles, as you can see there. And it, it looked really cool. And um, I think that the decals are one of the things that caused the, the cruiser to kind of go viral is people just like that aesthetic look. So, yeah. This is one of the few like built cruisers on Instagram that I can show my wife and she's like, Oh, I like that one. Yeah. <laughs> and it, I mean, it had real B locks, 37s, like I said, right yeah. out of the gate. Um, some custom drawers that one of my buddies had helped me with. So it, I would say it was kind of like a overland esque crawler at this point. Um, mm -hmm. it was set up where I could still throw all three of the kids in the back. Um, had a fridge, I could, you know, store some random gear. And I, I did really like the four by four labs rear bumper that was on it for a while. So I kept that. Um, Very clean. Yeah. That's what yeah. I have on my hundred. And then I ended up getting a roof rack, some Delta radius arms to clear the 37s a little bit better um, with factory radius arms. It wasn't driving very good. So I, I learned a lot about, you know, solid axle suspension and caster adjustment and kind of what had to be done to make it drivable with the suspension setup I had at least more drivable. So got some Shieldman's in there. That's to my, to this day, one of my favorite things I've ever done to the 80 is just super comfortable seats. Those are yeah. really nice. Um, and they look real, real nice. Yep. <laughs> they match and the interior so they, well. They do match really nice. The 80 doesn't come with, an armrest and the little factory center consoles like so low and off to the right that when I saw you could get an armrest on those Shieldman's, I was like, I'm sold <laughs> right, right out of the gate. <laughs> um, had some led lights in there for a while and didn't really love, love them and wanted to go back to like more of a factory OEM style headlights. So yeah, you've gone through a few headlights. Yeah. yeah. Do you feel like this is a carryover of the Tacoma community? Getting <laughs> <laughs> kind of. I, I one of the main reasons I want to do it is because the halogen lights that came on it are terrible. Like yeah, oh, it's horrible. Yeah. Um, I'm actually in the process now of converting to quad headlights, like you'd see in Australia. But I can actually just get Holly four by six LEDs straight mm, in them yeah. that will look really OEM. Like they look really classy, mm -hmm. um, but the light output will be way better than what I have now. Yeah, and I've been stripes, watching all the uh, the stories of the saw, multiple coats of saw, amber. Such a frustrating <laughs> process. Um, stripes changed colors, bumpers changed. Um, I went with Descent Armor stuff front and rear. Their stuff's great. Mm -hmm. um, this is the start of the big three link project. So yeah, that was a, that was a question uh, from uh, Deedster. Uh, Deedster asked. Uh, three link info, please. So. Yeah. So the three link kit is a four wheel underground full kit. Um, so he's got a lot of different options, um, based on kind of what steering setup you want to go with, but all the links themselves, the joints, um, even my coilovers, my radical coilovers were sourced straight from him. Um, he's amazing at what he does. He helped with spring rates and kind of making sure the coilovers were set up based on my specific truck correctly. Hmm. Um, I'm not a fab guy, unfortunately, but I have a, a guy local to me um, named Todd over at ZFab Off-Road that helped with the three-link installation. Cool. So he did all the actual fab work. It, it's a big process on an 80. You know, you're, you're cutting all the regular coil buckets out. You're putting new towers in front you have to completely what i did was a hellfire knuckle so i, I knew i wanted high steer and if i was going to do it i wanted to do it right with a beefier actual knuckle bigger trunnion bearing um machined arm so i just got all the parts and did it all at once and 
that causes you can see some really tight clearance with yeah you know yeah. Yeah. some of the components there the fitting the the hydro steer was tricky just packaging in general it's really tight so um it all works amazing now you know nothing contacts even under full bump and the three link was one of the best things i've ever done at the 80. a lot of the guys ask me like how does it drive after a three link and it drives better um mm -hmm. with a three link you're able to set your caster exactly where you want it set your axle exactly where you want it and I have about a two inch longer wheelbase now and right at six degrees caster. So it's just, oh, wow. like it, yeah, it tracks nice. down the road. Great. It's planted with my radius arms. I actually got an alignment like right before we did this project. And even with high caster radius arms, I was at like zero degrees caster. So it, you wow. know, it yeah. just drove down the road like a boat. <clears throat> and um, I, I could have added like extra high caster bushings to those arms and dialed that in a little bit more. There's things you can do, but the nice thing about the three link is it's just, you set stuff exactly where you want it. Um, and the, the coilovers are tuned nice enough where on road driving characteristics are still really good. So. it's awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Folks don't realize how important caster is. Oh yeah. Yeah. And, and like, it's, oh. it's a little different on a solid axle versus, you know, trying to explain to people how positive and negative caster can affect wheel placement on an IFS is way different. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it, it's super important, especially on a solid axle when you're talking about how much it's going to wander on road. Mm -hmm. um, and those issues can be really hard to chase down on a solid axle too. So, and then here's the, the new rear bumper. I started doing some really technical trails, taking the 80 to Moab and moab is its own beast right like you're you're not going to get hung up in other trails where you do in moab but i kept getting hung up on that rear bumper and i i told ben hey man i'm thinking about going back to like a four by four labs with no swing and he's like dude ship your 80 to me tell me what you want we'll design a bumper and i was like done so the 80 went on a truck over to descent and i told him you know, I'm fine with you cutting however much frame you need to cut, but as best of a departure angle as possible. Still want a hitch receiver that's kind of integrated into the center of the rear in case I ever want to carry like a bike rack or something. Mm -hmm. um, I'm never going to tow with it, but they nailed it. Um, it looks great. The, the angle is amazing. I've kissed it a couple times on some of the really hard trails out in the hills here, but it I barely ever touch it compared to the old bumper setup it's just so much tighter to the body so that was the story behind the, the different rear i remember so, uh watching like the progression of that high clearance build and he actually has one for the hundreds now which is amazing and i think it looks so good yep yep and a lot of people say well i want to swing out I kind of told Ben that's not important for me because I knew I, I was going to get that bell fab carrier and put it in the rear anyway. Um, I mm -hmm. wanted more weight centered over the axle and less weight hanging off the back just for wheeling purposes. And I told Ben, like, keep it as tight as you can. And if that means like it's never going to be swing out compatible, I don't think that's a big deal. Um, yeah. So that's the solution for the spare tire. Yeah. That's bell fab makes that. And you can f stuff a 40 in there. That's a 37 i have a 39 in there now and the the rear seat still locks in place so it fits <laughs> great um and it driving it is so much more enjoyable now with all that weight kind of more centered over that rear axle um especially off-road like no more weight up top so i got rid of the roof rack went to bigger tires this is kind of the process of clearancing front and rear fenders for the 39s um so you only had to buy tires twice with this one, not three times. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. A lot oh, of people, man. when they go to like a 39 or 40, you're cutting the pinch weld out of the rear. You're, you're tacking it. You're seam sealing it. I love the look of the fender flares on the 80s. And even going to this big of a tire, I wanted to keep my fender flares. So this is kind of the end look of what it ended up looking like with trimming the fender flares to stay on, but still having the tires you know, at full bump, clear the inside of the fender and flare together and be able to still steer lock to lock. Um, and then there's Descent's new front bumper that's requires kind of a frame chop of the front frame rail too. Way, way better approach angle than their other one. 
which is already extremely impressive. Yeah, the other one's already good. Um, got some some goal wings on there from Sol Function. So it's kind of just I'm actually transitioning away from a drawer now, and I'm going to have a sleeper platform in the back that I can store spare drive shaft, CV, probably a Pro Eagle or some kind of jack under. So all my spare parts will go under for wheeling trips. I'll be able to secure them, and then I'll still have a sleeping platform for mm-hmm. like running the Rubicon this summer, so I don't have to bring you know a tent. That's awesome. Um, so no more fridge in the back. I have a small fridge. I'll probably just strap down in my back seat somewhere for those kind of like couple day wheeling trips. And it, it's progressed to kind of a full time wheeling rig. Um, <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. it's still drivable on the road even with the thirty nines, but because of the the type of wheeling I like to do now and wanting to push limits as much as possible, I'm just gonna start trailering it to places that way if if something disastrous does happen, I can still get home. You know, I'll I'll tow it yeah. back and fix you just it picked up that there. that really nice trailer that you've been yeah with. like yeah. really nice, it, super nice trailer. I trailers are like resale value on trailers <laughs> is nuts. Yeah. I, I, I was looking for like months to try to find something drive over fender five k or seven k axles, and like no one's taking any money off a used trailer, so. <laughs> they're like seven years old and still asking for like a thousand dollars under MSRP. You know, it's mm-hmm. crazy. So I just figured at that point, I don't know what the condition, the axles or, or hubs or anything would be in. So I might as well just get myself one straight from the factory, which is what I did. So, so yeah, I'll be taking some big trips with the 80 this summer, just kind of towing it behind the Duramax. And I'm excited to put, put it all together and let it, let it go to work. So, yeah. So, so speaking of, of tow rigs, so in the middle of, uh, of the 80, this, uh, this little <laughs> Nissan showed up Yeah. Uh, so, and, and all our Nissan friends got real excited and said, yeah. he's, he's switching teams. He's switching teams. Yeah. Uh, but no. So I love this truck. Actually, the, the whole idea behind this was when I started working at C4 fabrication, I was started to build the 80. I had a Ford edge and that was my daily. Um, and transitioning into C4, I was in medical sales previously. So I wanted to kind of get rid of the Tacoma and make sure that I was doing that transition the best way possible for my family. So that's why the Tacoma went bye-bye, paid cash for the 80. And I was just kind of driving that beater as a daily and eventually got to the point where I was like, okay, I think I'm ready for another truck that I can daily. So we, we sold the edge and I picked up a new frontier. So this is the first and only brand new vehicle I've ever purchased in my entire life. Hmm. Um, and I immediately started cutting it up, but <laughs> as you it, do owning a Tacoma and owning one of these, these are so much better than a third gen Tacoma. Oh, wow. Um, oh my. Yeah. The, the eight speed <laughs> is better. There's more power. The like, 360 cameras front camera i mean i had the pro 4x trim so i guess i got some of those features but Mm -hmm. sound system seating like the display infotainment everything about this truck i loved it drove great um i threw like a two inch dobinson ims their their lower end suspension on there and some 33s and kind of low pro armor i knew this was my daily so that's kind of i set it up to be more like a i can go out and hunt and adventure a little bit with my family and I'm, I'm never going to wheel this truck on difficult trails because that's what the 80s for, you know, so kind of right. a different yeah. mindset going into this truck. And I loved it. Like, even like this, it would get 18, 19 miles per gallon. Yeah, um, those eight speeds are wild. I, yeah. I actually worked for the company that supplied the the head units to to these. I was their quality engineer. Really? And uh, yeah, it was, it was it's a Bosch head unit. Um Gotcha. I actually left working with Nissan when these came out. <laughs> I never got to uh, test drive one or, or see it in action, but the they're, they're only sweet. problem. Yeah. The only problem I ever had with mine is I was getting like a gear line. Um, and since it was under warranty, they couldn't figure it out. They actually just completely swapped my rear axle. <laughs> yeah. That's and then, awesome. it went, then it went away. So I, I'm assuming it was just set. Like the lash was set incorrectly from factory. I don't know. But huh. other than that, I never had a single issue. It was super reliable. And yeah, I loved it. It was just, we had our third kid. And um, 
as our third kid started getting bigger, that truck started feeling smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, that was the only complaint. And I knew that was, I don't know what I thought I was going to, was going to happen and get into another midsize truck, you know, with several kids, obviously kids keep growing. It's not like the back seats getting any bigger on those midsize trucks, but I no, I loved the frontier. So it's a good looking truck. I will yeah, give it that. Yeah. It's a very good looking truck. Yeah. They kind of, they didn't position themselves very good. They came out like with a really good naturally aspirated V6 platform on the tail end of everyone then transitioning into like, forced induction four cylinders where like their specs were good for like four months and then just got blown out of the water by everybody yeah um but i think that they'll nissan's good about keeping platforms alive for a long time and being fairly competitive with pricing so i don't think they're going anywhere anytime that, soon. that's one way to say it yeah little marketing <laughs> flair on there <laughs> My All right. So speaking of speaking of marketing, uh, then then you bought the uh, you bought the marketing hype on the F one fifty, huh? Yeah. So what I'm telling you, the main reason I got into F one fifty, two reasons: the backseat space is unreal on these Huge. trucks. Huge. Like all three of my kids could be strapped in, and my 110 pound golden retriever could be standing in front of them, like they're. Mm-hmm. Oliver couldn't kick my seat anymore. Like it was amazing. Um, and then the, the eco boost and it's towing capabilities. Um, I had the travel trailer at this point that we towed on camp trips and not that the Nissan struggled with it, but I just knew something like this would tow it a lot nicer. And in the back of my head, I knew where the 80 was that eventually I wanted to be able to tow it. And I knew that a half ton pickup like this, would be able to tow an 80 across the country, maybe not super comfortably, but like I knew it would get the job done and still be a great daily. So that's kind of why I went this route. And I love the truck aesthetically for the most part, it drove nice until it didn't. Um, <laughs> this one was short lived and it, it was a hundred percent due to just the truck having issues. Um, Hmm. towing the travel trailer to Oregon and back it threw me into lint mode several times because it was overheating like my ect wow. my temps would get up to like 255 260 and that trailer is like 2500 pounds yeah and the tow spec on this is supposed to be like 10k easy you know yeah and i swapped in four different sets of t stats i did like a full you know, I did plugs, I did full coolant flush, pretty much anything you could do to try to track down like basic overheating issues on these things. And Ford basically just kept coming back to me and saying like, yeah, these things just kind of run hot. <laughs> I was like, well, if it can't tow the travel trailer, it's sure as heck not going to tow the Land Cruiser without overheating. Right. And it, then it started having some like really hard clunky shifts. The 10 speed just kind of shifted erratically from the beginning and a typical Ford. I kind of got that same answer. That's just, yeah, it's just a 10 speed thing, you know, but there was a couple like violent downshifts in there where like, you know, the whole truck's like giving me whiplash and I reset the transmission a couple times. It would fix it for like a week and then it would start doing it again. I kind of got out of this one before something really bad happened. So I love the truck, but ultimately it wasn't worth gambling on it long-term, which is yeah. why the, the Ford left. So then you, uh, well, what I call you press the easy button. Uh, <laughs> and, and oh, you, it looks so dirt. bad with that body lift on there. <laughs> I um, remember when you posted this picture, I was like, like what, what is, what is, what is going on? Doing? <laughs> um, <laughs> so at this point I knew, what I want to do with the 80, I knew I wanted to be able to tow it. Like I want to go to the Rubicon. I want to run some of these trails that are like across the country. Wasn't driving very far to commute anymore to work. And I wanted to just buy cash, something that could tow and is capable and tons of research on, you know, I get an old power stroke. Do I get a Chevy? Um, this specific engine, the LBZ, which is like 06, 07 Duramax was right before emissions um they didn't really have any issues like some of the earlier lby 
or excuse me, LLY engines had some issues. Um, these ones, they kind of worked out a lot of those kinks and just they're reliable, like up to 350, 450,000, like people run these trucks into the ground. So I looked for a long time to find one that didn't have any blow by, um, was fairly low miles. I mean, it's got like 150 K on it, but it already had a, yeah. a lift pump on there and, um, it was as deleted as it could be. And it was in good shape, no rust. And that's kind of what I wanted. It's, I still shake my head at what I paid for this thing. Um, like I think what 25 grand, like I'll just 25 grand for this old of a truck, um, which I think is insane, but it's, there's a cult following for these things. And now that I've had it for, you know, five or six months and I've driven it every day, like I absolutely love this truck. I can, I can see why people pay what they do for them. Um, the power's great. It tows like it's no one's business. I can't feel anything behind it. Um, it drives great. The IFS on these trucks, you know, I, I revamped the suspension and went through and replaced like control arms and um, as much as I could because, you know, you get 150K on these trucks without replacing a lot of that stuff. It's shot. Mm -hmm. So I did tie rods and a lot of different stuff and it, it just rides great and it'll tow the 80, no problem. So that's kind of what spawned that is just a solid daily that's going to be able to tow very very easily and reliably so yeah it, yeah you're right it'll tow the 80 no problem it will have um all the normal gm gremlins uh it'll yep. be a little electrical things window switches you know body control oh, yeah. modules yep. door i already sensors. have a couple yeah. switches don't work already yeah. just, <laughs> my mirror, mirror switch doesn't work you know luckily my the dash still dash still works um i got a couple lights on there like my four-wheel drive light doesn't turn on but it's just like the you know with yeah, the truck <laughs> truck from that age like what do you expect so, well the geez. dashes don't <laughs> die all together on those they just kind of slowly yeah. you lose more just, and more yeah you just gotta knock on them until the lights <laughs> turn back on um but yeah it's been great and i i just threw some 35s on there with i got rid of the body lift thank god and just kind of went with a torsion key lift in front with a little bit of a spacer in the back, some new longer shocks to give it about two inches. So to clear the, the bigger tires and that's about it. Nice. Well, before we wrap up talking about your builds, let's go back to the 80 for one minute. I want to make sure I get this uh, question from our friend Scott. Uh, he says on the 80, he says, is, is the final, is this the final iteration uh, of the 80 build uh or do you have regrets that mean it's not going to be the final i i i'll probably do some kind of rear suspension setup eventually the only thing i think when people ask that question they're referring to like axles um for what it would cost to do one tons properly and redo the full three link in front with new axle mounts and then do more fender trimming. I just don't think it's worth it. Um, the 80 axles are fairly strong and I've beefed them up as much as possible. I mean, they're chromoly axle shafts, front and rear, bigger trunnion bearings, ARP hardware. The nice thing about the 80 axles is they're way higher clearance than a one ton. Yes. Um, and they're narrower. So unless you're doing a custom cut one ton with custom shafts, you're way wider, which means way more fender trimming and oftentimes less up travel. Um, so there's pros and cons. And I think for the monetary investment that that would cost, it just, it wouldn't make sense. It would make more sense to just do a dedicated like mini truck crawler or something mm -hmm. at that point. Um, yeah. So I think this is the final iteration other than maybe just like improving some stuff over time. Um, I've even like, I've been on the LS, like, is that worth it? <laughs> And now that I'm going to be trailering the 80, not for what it costs, you know. Yeah, that's fair. Um, if I had the time to do like a junkyard LS swap and teach myself the ins and outs of the harness and everything I need to do, that would be cool. But it's not really needed for how I'm going to be using the truck now, trailering it to like more technical trails. The one thing I would do is slap on. I've talked to the Magnuson guys a little bit, and there's talks that they might come out with a new supercharger. Um, hmm. for the fz so really? if that okay. if that actually happened i would i'd slap on a supercharger um and just have a little bit more torque off-road be nice 
there have been some climbs where even with low range gears, I, I wish I had some more power. Um, like poison spider trying to get up the waterfall, you know, 80 couldn't do it. My buddy with his LS just <laughs> ripped right up it. But like, is that worth a $40,000 engine swap? Probably not. You know, I could just winch it. Um, See, so you, you've gone from talking about a junkyard LS to a $40,000. Well, well, he works for, he works for profits. He had, he had yeah. a nice one, but yeah, I mean, this is probably as final as it gets other than just, you know, tweaking stuff to to make it more my style over time or dial it in as i see some random need from running more and more technical stuff as things progress but very cool. supercharger would be nice supercharger would be nice for the investment that would cost i think that'd be the one thing i think would be worth it from a performance standpoint yeah um, but with my luck i'd throw it on there and i'd blow my engine up and <laughs> you know there's pros and cons to everything probably do like four to six psi yeah and i'm sure magnuson goal. if they actually come out with a new one i'm sure that they would be like six to ten psi and maybe they would you can't really tune these trucks like the you know you can do like a standalone but you're talking a lot <laughs> it's of a money. whole other mess yeah, yeah it's a whole other mess so yeah um and you can mess with mass airflow stuff and I don't know. I'm sure they would figure it out. Um, <laughs> so, so we've gone through all five of the the builds that you've documented here. We didn't even bring the uh, the trailers in. There's been the the travel trailer and the the hauling trailer uh, along yeah. with that. Um, but outside of the vehicles, there's there's one other thing that really took off on your uh, Instagram account. And uh, we've got a little three-minute montage here, and I'm going to play through all of this because I, I think it's I think it's if you saw it before, if you saw it last year when it really hit, uh, it's worth watching again. So let's let's bring Ollie up. Here. All right, I could get him. He's probably going to bed right now. Right? <laughs> hey, Marty, you proud it, and I worked. Oh, he was so little. You have a little winner. <laughs> A little one? <laughs> yeah. Hi, my name Marty. You put it and I, I wrote it. Have you tried that cat time? <laughs> Hello, darkness, my old friend. <laughs> my name Marty. You put it and I wrote it. Nope. He had no weight and no money. <laughs> Our ranches are beautiful. Never mind. <laughs> that the ugly half. Uh. Hi, I am. You pulled it and I wrote it. You get it. That thing's ugly. You're not agree what you doing, Major. <laughs> I had it. You posted it. Now look at it. I think the circle mom can drop on the way to my mom. What did he say? I oh. had <laughs> I had it. You posted it and I wrote it. Is that pony act at kick? <laughs> uh, that's a good one. <laughs> they do look real similar. I, I on it. You post it, and I wrote it. You got my dead bike, dude. Alright, came crashing, and I'm so long. So long. Hi, I on it. This is Zach. That's me, and here we are again for another Roast My Rig. So, Ollie, let's go ahead and rip this Band-Aid off. X Overland has answered the question for all of us, how much can you pay to spend a weekend in Montana? Never mind it, don't be. And don't be fooled, because those roof boxes, they're not for gear. They're to carry around their YouTube plaques. I can buy a lot of for that money. <laughs> I mean, let's be honest, the narration has gotten a little bit out of hand. You're not pushing the limits of man, nature, and machine. You're camping next to a family in their Honda Odyssey. I just did it. At least I am not 50. <gasps> Can't say he's wrong. So this has been a very collaborative 8.9 out of 10. Hi, I'm Marty. You both did an I 
Roast Did that hit Brango photo? <gasps> <laughs> I'm going to put it in my rope. Dad, our race car pulled to recess. What game won't they lose? <laughs> it's okay, guys. I'm cleaning it. I'll make you feel better. Cream on the inside, clean on the outside. Cream on the inside, clean on the outside. Cream on the... Oh, man, those are great. That is fantastic. Uh, Truly fantastic. <laughs> his eyebrows make the whole the whole. Oh, thing. his eyebrows are wild. I have no idea where he gets them either. They stand straight up. It's awesome. You post it, I roast it. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, so how'd that come to be? How did you get the idea to have Ollie roast people's rigs? I don't even remember. I think... We went on a trip to get the travel trailer. I brought Oliver, and we went to Oregon. Um, and before him roasting rigs, I had done like, hey, send your tag in, and I'll roast your vehicle, and I'll just post on my story. Like I had done that a couple times. And me and Oliver sit in this hotel room, kind of just bored, and I think I made a story. The, the first couple were on a story, and I had said, like, send your vehicle in, Oliver will roast them. And – he what he obviously was super cute and he could talk good enough where you could understand most of it and he had a good enough memory and i mean he was pretty young at that point where if i rattle the sentence off he could just repeat it so it was like a lot of like simultaneous clips taken and we would mash them up and um sometimes i'd show him the vehicle of like a picture of the vehicle and get some inspiration for what he thought. Right. But um, we posted like two or three of them and my phone just started blowing up from people like thinking it was the funniest thing ever. Yep. Um, so then I took a couple of those stories and posted them as reels. And then it kind of just, you know, snowballed from there. People ask me, Hey, we'll all roast my rig. And so we did it a couple more times, you know, every couple of weeks. Um, and then he just kept getting bigger and his speech kept getting better. And gosh, it's crazy. I see those videos. I'm just like, he was so little. Um, we did one, I think a couple months ago, maybe. Um, but he talks so much better now. It's nuts. So. <laughs> yeah, I, I imagine you had no idea that it would take off the way that no, it did. No, I, I was hoping that like one of them would pop off and like really blow up, but it's a pretty niche thing. Like a roast little kid roasts overland vehicles, you know, but <laughs> we had fun with it. And he's always loved the Tacoma and the 80 and kind of adventuring with me. And um, he loves like watching those videos and just be kind of being involved. And I would read him some of the comments. And so he, he just ate it up. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. My eight month old is is like, hey, I wanna I wanna look at your phone. And I'm like, oh, maybe one day she'll be roasting folks. <laughs> yeah, do it. <laughs> do it. My we have a, a little girl that's she'll be three in July, but she's watched a couple of those videos and then she she'll even be like, post it, roast it. Like, I'm like oh, uh oh. Should we should we do one? But you know, it it's fun. It's been fun involving him for sure. So yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. So let's take it back to uh, Black Hills Builds. What was the inspiration for creating that Instagram account, which was Black Hills Taco, and yep. then kind of documenting everything as you've gone through those builds? Like, what made you do that? You know, I think it started out as w w trying to find community in that space. Um, we had lived in the hills for a couple of years, but I didn't really have any friends that had similar interests. Um, other than maybe a couple and they weren't really involved on social media and they didn't have Tacomas. So it, it kind of started as a way for me to get inspiration for my own builds and see what other people had done. And as I progressed in different modifications to the trucks or different setups, obviously I had a lot of questions and was able to lean into some people as far as what they had done on their builds and issues they ran into and troubleshooting some random things. So it definitely started more as like, looking for kind of community to connect with that had similar interests. Um, and then snowballed into 
me enjoying photography and enjoying the process of kind of documenting changes on my page and going back and looking at the different iterations of the vehicles and where they used to be. Um, and then as I would do that, I would get questions from people and was able mm -hmm. to kind of help them along the same journey that I had gone through with the Tacoma or with the 80 and be kind of like a resource and some knowledge for guys. Um, the Land Cruiser especially, there's a ton of information out there on forums and it can be very difficult to sift through. I've yes. done it, right? I've spent hours and hours reading through like 60 pages of forums to try to find an answer. And luckily I've made some really good Land Cruiser buddies and I can go to them directly with like weird technical questions now. And they'll be like, let me look at page 86 of the FSM. And <laughs> you know, yep. so I have those resources now, but I was able to kind of be that for some people and pass the knowledge I had learned along to different people getting into kind of the Land Cruiser space, the Tacoma space that, weren't familiar with forums and are like a younger generation that like they look to social media or Facebook groups or different avenues to try to find information. Um, so that's been cool is just trying to get to, you know, help people along the process. Like I was helped by other people. So. Yeah. It's an interesting point that you bring up because I was, I was into Miatas before I got my Land Cruiser and the Miata forum is extensive. Like there's basically no topic that hasn't been broached and explained fully and as i went through that it went away from like i'm looking at forum posts from 2011 all the way you know back to 2000 and now folks are on facebook pages asking all the questions and it's just not really the same like continuation of knowledge like you get the same questions over and over again and it's hard yep. to link um so that's kind of i i'm like similar in that regard on my instagram where folks with hundreds will come to me all the time with questions and i'm happy to link a forum post because you know you figure out how to google it and whatnot but uh um, yeah yeah and it's, it's a lot of that stuff is really googleable which is nice is that a word yeah. googleable it's oh, gotta yeah. be yeah yeah. Um, yeah my pro tip is you put site colon forum dot i hate mud dot com yeah and, and then, then you so only get results from there yeah, yeah I, and i've had questions like hey are, do you have a build thread no, I, I had like <laughs> documenting photos and videos and stuff on socials yeah. enough work, let alone like I have story of those, lights. <laughs> yeah. Some of those guys go nuts, like more power to them, like step yes. by step installs with pictures. Like I've my hand has been held through so many things because of the amount of knowledge people have put into their forums and build threads on mud specifically. But like when I've got those questions, I've just kind of like rolled my eyes. Like how do people have time for that? That is insane. You know, like yeah. I, I would love to say I, I would do it, but there's no chance. Same. So the taco was the first Instagram build you could call it. Was there an overland off road trail ready, anything before the Instagram taco? Not really. I had had some just general trucks like Ram 1500, different things like that, that I had lifted and done wheels and tires and have kind of always been into like semi building up my vehicles and making them a little bit more capable or more my style, um, setting them up to kind of hunt or mm -hmm. do basic trails, but not to that level. No, I didn't really get interest or, you know, direct interest in kind of like off-roading or overlanding you could say until the Tacoma and I think what spawned that was kind of as I started documenting it and doing more research I saw that platform specifically the aftermarket support it had how people with that specific truck really dove into this space and built their trucks out specific to the space and it kind of aligned with my interests and I had already started kind of getting into some of those trails out in the hills and enjoying it and it just kind of went wild from there so that's awesome that's awesome uh one thing that we do like to see is is all the collaboration that you've had you mentioned c4 fab and descent how has that kind of tailored your builds are you looking for a company that fits what you want or are you going to companies to see what they have that may fit your vehicle how how do you approach those collaborations yeah, so I've been super blessed to be able to work with a lot of cool brands in the industry um, on, you know, almost every build. And I'm proud to say that I've never just like taken products from a brand and throw them on my truck and taken money for it. Or 
I've never promoted a product that I don't personally want to use or believe in. Um, most of the brands on every single one of my vehicles have been what I would consider the top brands in their space, really quality mm -hmm. parts. Um, and I'm happy to pay full price for something to have it be exactly what I want. Um, so as I've developed some of these relationships with these brands, um, a lot of them spawn from me, like already having that brand stuff on my vehicle and them approaching me to be in a booth or to, you know, collaborate with them on some level. Um, it just really varies, but it's, it's been awesome to kind of get to know some of these business owners and marketing teams and provide some value where I can. Um, yeah, hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Yeah. And I think that goes, uh, kind of along. We had another, uh, uh, viewer question. This is from, uh, DJD five, two, four. Uh, and they're asking what role do you feel what role do you feel influencers in the overland community? I think they're asking to disclose partnerships. So, you know, basically uh, what is the obligation of the, the influencer to say, Hey, I'm getting compensated for this, or I, I got a discount on this in, in some way. But I mean, we know what should happen, uh, but we, we also know it doesn't always happen. Yeah, I think that like technically there's different state regulations for a lot of that stuff um, or a lot of that's driven by the company. I personally would love it if everyone disclosed all that stuff. Um, it's pretty easy to spot if you just are aware of what you're mm -hmm. looking at. Um, unfortunately, a lot of people push products that I would consider to not be good, reputable companies or products in order to just make affiliate commissions or to like give themselves more benefit, um, which is kind of a bummer. You know, I always just encourage people to do research on parts, talk to people that have ran them, make sure that they're quality. Um, don't just watch someone's post about something and immediately buy it without digging <laughs> into it on your own. Um, I've been offered like, Hey, we'll set up an affiliate code for you. And I've never done it for any brand, just even brands I, I care about and that I'm proud to represent. Um, cause I just, I don't feel good about making funds off of other people's purchases. If that makes sense. I've never been, yeah. I've never wanted any of these brand relationships to turn into like, a income driver for me you know i've never wanted my income to be tied directly to social media promotion because at the point that's what it is for me it doesn't become fun anymore it just mm -hmm. becomes straight work um so all my partnerships have been more like organic like if, if i can provide value to you guys in any way i'd love to work with you in some way shape or form but it's it's never been the opposite which is what you see occasionally it just depends on the person you know yeah. feel that yeah. I, I I but definitely it, do. And, and, you know, we talked about when, when John and I started doing this show, I said, the one thing I don't want to do is I don't want to do product reviews of the latest Chinese trinket for a Amazon affiliate link. Like there, there's a hundred other videos you can go watch tonight if that's what you want to watch. But yeah. if you want to actually meet the, the people and hear the stories behind quality products and services and everything this community is made of, that's what we're about delivering. So yeah. 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 After after our last episode or second to last episode with Perry's parts, I was like, okay, I want these on my truck. And he's like, I'll give you a hundred percent off discount code. And I'm like, nah, like I'm gonna buy these. Like he did give me a little bit off, but I didn't I'm not gonna take that for free because that's not what we set out to do. It's it's more of showing and, and educating less than shilling and pushing. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And you can see when you're on someone's platform and that's the kind of content they push out is, you know, it's content that's centered around discount codes and product promotions and like no shade against any creators that do that. Like mm -hmm. if, for all I know, that's how they're putting bread on the table for their oh, sure. Like more yeah. power to you. Um, it's just, it's obvious as an audience to understand intent behind that stuff. And you just have to be aware. And if, if you don't mind it, cool, you know, follow those people, take advantage of the deals they're giving you, like try to save some money. Um, I've always just wanted my content to feel as organic as possible. And yeah, I might feature some products or something that I like every once in a while, but like I've never ever wanted my page or content to feel like, Oh, Wes is just 
shilling out some stuff, you know, to make a buck like that. That's not who I am. It's yeah. Just, well, it's just a new, you know, 10, 15 years ago, uh, like Hot Rod TV and all of those shows were really just a big infomercial, right? I mean, we, <laughs> yeah, we sure. love watching them. And, yeah. and that's what that's what the new promo code and product review videos yeah. have become. It's just it's taking the place of that. Yeah. 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 And those like those companies were for sure getting directly compensated by whatever product <laughs> yeah. they were featuring yeah. and making yeah. whatever percentage on the sale. And yeah, I remember sitting there watching stuff like that growing up. Oh, you yeah. Know? Just like everyone else. So, <laughs> so Wes, that, that's. So that kind of leads us to the to the now, and and you gave us a little bit about your background. You did medical sales, then you ended up at C four uh, full time as the sales director there. Uh, but uh, as of today, you are full time with uh, your new venture along with your partner, uh, Adventure Driven Media Co. So give us the kind of the elevator pitch on on what the company is. Yeah. So we are a full scale digital advertising agency. So our primary services would be like PPC, pay-per-click management across various channels, Facebook, Google, Amazon, TikTok, whatever it may be, um, search engine optimization. So just helping different um, business owners show up higher within SERPs, primarily on Google, setting up their website, um, you know, on and off page, technical SEO, everything that that entails. Um, email marketing, whether that's like automation or campaigns, helping integrate that into people's websites and take advantage of that. Um, and I guess text too, it just hasn't really caught on a ton in our industry yet. Um, so those would be our three busiest things. And then we also kind of do some sales and marketing consulting, um, social media management, web design, or other things that you know we've done for clients that wouldn't be what I would consider like primary services, but that we're still very much capable to do. So. Well, it's all kind of it. It has to be a uh, kind of a holistic approach, right? With uh, you know digital marketing and and the social media management of it. I, I mean, can you have can you have a company now that you you have a, a digital marketing uh, department or brand, and you have a social media brand, and they're not collaborating? I mean, that I've I've seen that as disaster. I'm assuming you see the same. Yeah, for the most part, it's it's usually direct collaboration there. I think where we provide a lot of value to companies is the stuff that we do is very technical and requires a lot of experience, really um, just time learning the ins and outs of all these platforms and the technical side and the average business owner doesn't have the time to learn or the motivation and it's super overwhelming for them. Um, and we're able to kind of go in and provide value immediately that is, like a metric that they can actually see, you know, we can say at the end of the month, here's what we did and here's how it helped your business. And it's not like a, a what if it's, it's tangible, there's numbers associated with it. So the whole goal is to try to help companies grow through whatever their goals might be. And every company is a little bit different. Is it sales based? Is it, you know, brand awareness? Um, we don't really have packages cause every company is different. Um, so, we look at your company's individual needs and the pieces you have in place to manage those needs already and try to position ourselves to where we could best fit in to, to help that specific company. And, and you're focused uh, specifically on kind of this uh, outdoor off-road automotive niche. Is that true? Yeah. So kind of some, I guess, a little bit of backstory on how it spiraled into a full-time career, but I was doing these services through my position at C4. Um, and one of my friends owns a business in the industry and kind of caught wind that I was doing that. He's like, we have a guy doing that for us and he's not doing a good job. Would you mind looking at this? And I said, yeah, no problem. And he ended up saying, Hey, I want you to do this moving forward. And I was like, okay, cool. I can do this nights, weekends. That's not a big deal. And did a really good job for him. And he referred me to a buddy and through referrals and over the course of, you know, two years now, almost, um, it transpired into like, I did not have time nights and weekends anymore to, to do both C4 and this, and just wanted to focus all my energy into the business. So 
it slowly progressed from kind of a little side hustle of mine trying to help a buddy out into like a full blown career, which has been a big blessing. Um, but I guess that's some backstory on how it started. Repeat the question one more time and I'll, I'll answer specifically. Uh, I don't remember exactly what I asked, but I've got a follow up to, to kind of how we landed there. It's, it's interesting. So you said it kind of, uh, uh, was word of mouth and referral by referral. Um, uh, and here you are a, a digital marketing agency. Uh, and it always goes back at the end of the day that you, you can't beat a direct referral, right? Like that's, that's kind of uh, yep. a marketing 101. but how does, uh, now that you, so, so now you've, you've built up enough clientele that you're, you guys are willing to go out here uh, full time. So now you're kind of introducing yourself uh, to people you haven't met directly and trying to get the word out there. Um, yeah. So take us through what that looks like. Yeah. So I, I remembered your question. It was our most of our clients primarily in the space. Currently, yeah. yes, because we both come from the space. So we understand it. Um, and can provide a lot of value that sets us apart from other agencies. We understand the products. We understand the industry. We're probably familiar with your brand and we're able to really step in and you don't have to teach us that. Like we, we understand the sales process through and through. So most of our clients currently are, but they don't have to be. We work with a roofing company and some other random mm -hmm. companies outside the industry and the principles to their core apply across many industries. Um, but to answer your question, so my partner, Keegan Keller, he was the full-time sales and marketing director for CBI Off-Road. So C4's kind of direct competitor. Um, Keegan and I had met several years ago just through shows in the industry. Like we're, we're basically working similar positions for competitive companies. And yeah. CBI actually helped build out my frontier. So I got to spend a lot of time with Keegan when, when they were building my frontier, which C4 didn't make products for. Um, and I think that's kind of how it started. I told him what I was doing for a couple companies and Keegan used to work for an advertising agency prior to going full-time with CBI. Um, and I needed help at that point. And we had built a pretty good relationship foundation and we decided, Hey, let's, let's just go in together on something and we'll see what happens. Um, and that was a little over a year ago. So we we're kind of both grinding on the company nights and weekends outside of normal business hours, taking more referrals and building it up as things went. And like you said, referrals are amazing. And we were able to do a good enough job for the companies we were working with where they kept feeding us more and more companies. Um, so we didn't have to really make that hard decision. Do I go out on a limb and take this risky jump for us? It was very much so like, we don't have the time to do both and this is now sustainable for us. So in order to really focus on it and grow it, we need to jump into it full time, which is still a scary thing to do. You know, benefits are a real thing and <laughs> um, jumping into your own thing full time. Obviously neither of us had ever done that before. So there's a big learning curve with the logistics of just completely running your own business top to bottom and tax liability and just a bunch of stuff. I don't, need to talk about, but it, well, has, has lot, there been anything that, that kind of blindsided you there? I mean, it, it happens to a lot of entrepreneurs, right? That yeah. like, you know, you just wake up one morning and you get this email and you're like, well, what is that? Nobody told me about this. <laughs> yeah. Not yet. We, okay. since we were kind of doing it for a year, like we, we have a joint LLC and we're, we're like true business partners and I'm kind of OCD. So I was consulting like tax attorneys and making sure that our ducks were in a row so that, you know, in order to make this successful long-term, like I wanted to lay the correct foundation to do so. Um, so it's for the most part been great. And we've been full-time now for almost a month and it's been awesome. I mean, I'm more busy now than I was before, which doesn't make sense to me, but I think it's, <laughs> th this is all I'm doing now. So I'm just devoting all my time and energy into it. Um, but it is nice being at home, being able to like go eat lunch with my family. And sure. If I have to have an appointment or something, I can run, run to it come back and finish work later. Um, but yeah, it's, it's going great so far, but I, to answer your question, yeah, most of our companies are in the space. And I think the reason being is because we have so many of those ingrained relationships between the two of us and we love the space that it makes sense to try to, 
provide value to those companies that kind of operate in the same space we love. So is your, uh, is your partner moderately local to you? So he's actually in Idaho. So he lives, oh, mm. CBI is based in Idaho Falls. He lives in Idaho Falls. Um, but because of what we do is it's pretty much all online. We, yeah, you know, I got three monitors down here and we, we work fully remote. We set up, you know, zoom calls or Google meet calls with clients. Um, me and Keegan talk daily, multiple times a day and kind of have some software management that we can assign tasks to one another and make sure stuff's getting done on time when it needs to be. And we've, because we've already, excuse me, been doing it for a year, we've worked out a lot of those kinks. So like that transition into full time wasn't really a big adjustment. It was just now we actually have time, you know, now we can, <laughs> yeah, now we can breathe a little bit and kind of focus. So let me, if you don't mind, Wes, let's kind of dive into some of the, the nuts and bolts on uh, uh, campaigns and uh, uh, really calculating the, the ROI on digital advertising, because this is a big thing. And in, in my professional career, I've spent a lot of time uh, analyzing uh, profit and loss statements and, and going line by line and going, OK, what is this twenty five hundred dollars a month? And they say, well, that's for our social media uh, consultant. Uh, all right. So what are we getting for that in, in dollars? How are we calculating that? And then, well, you know, nah, 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 nah. what uh, how do you guys look at that? Obviously, it's different with each each case and what the end goal of the campaign is. But uh, but how do you make sure that you're showing some type of quantifiable uh, ROI to your clients? Yeah, so that's a good question. I think depending on our service, that goal is going to change. If it's social media management, it could be an impressions or followers goal. If it's a PPC campaign, it could be a sales-based goal. If it's email marketing, it could be open subscribe rate, whatever that may be. But I guess for like PPC campaigns specifically, majority of our clients are some type of e-commerce or sales-based company. So like the goal of running paid ads is to make money. Um, there's a lot of strategy that can go into it and different platforms, that strategy can change. But what's nice about what we do is we're able to set properties up for clients, transfer ownership of those properties to the client, or just get access to the properties they already own mm -hmm. and make sure those properties are properly linked to their website channels, whether it's Shopify, WordPress, Wix, whatever it may be, so that any campaign we're actually managing has hard analytical data where at the end of the month I can say, here's what you spent in advertising. Here's the dollars in conversions that you pulled back in. So is this making sense for you guys? Um, and if it's not, we shouldn't do it. Um, so it's very much a black and white thing as for that specific type of campaign, which is nice for clients. Um, I will say not every agen agency is like that. Unfortunately, we've, taken over for some bigger agencies where the transparency is not there, which is kind of sad. Um, they, I, I really think that's, that's the norm from my yeah. experience in it is it's, yeah. there is no transparency. It's a big gray area. They have a lot of buzzwords around yeah. why they can't answer the question. You know, they've got a prepared statement as to yeah. why they can't give you an answer. Yep. So what we found a lot of these big agencies, what they do is, they have a huge Facebook platform or a huge Google platform and they'll create clients accounts on their own properties. So like, Oh, I have my own business manager on Facebook. I'll create client B an ad account and I'll run your ads on my account and you don't have access to it. And at the end of the month, I'll send you some random Excel document. That's a report that says all your metrics. And other than trusting them, there is, zero way to fact check those numbers. There's zero transparency. So the numbers we provide are like, we, we only access our clients accounts through their actual properties. And if they don't have properties, we're creating them for the client, transferring ownership to them. Mm -hmm. And then if, if they want help, like logging in and looking at the exact numbers we're giving them at the end of the month, we're happy to show you that. Um, it's sad that that's how it is, but it, it very much is a, these agencies take advantage of clients and try to position any metric as positive, even if it's not because they want to keep you as a client. Right. Um, we, we have had some clients for a long time now and a, most, 
of our clients are doing amazing. If we had a client that wasn't profitable month to month, we would be the first people to say, hey, paid ads aren't working for your product. It's too niche or, you know, you don't have the data to support correct audience targeting or whatever the case may be. Let's either stop service with you or pivot these funds into something that's going to make more of an impact for your company. Like whether that's organic SEO or email marketing campaigns or social media or whatever it may be. Um, but that's the kind of agency we want to be, you know, we want to be able to lay our head down at the end of the night and feel good about what we're doing and actually helping companies. So. It's awesome. How does that, um, you know, another thing when you talk about marketing and digital marketing is everyone wants to be ahead of the curve, right? Uh, the, you know, there's all these, jokes and some of them are not jokes, real conversations about the algorithm and what changed and what, you know, what the machine wants to see. Uh, how do you guys as a firm kind of stay educated and up to date on that and then make sure that, because uh, I'm sure it's not just set it and forget it with your clients, right? There's a constant yeah. evolution and looking back and making sure we're doing the best thing. Yeah. So again, it varies on the service. Um, but we're in these accounts every single day looking at things. Um, a, B testing campaigns to make sure that does tweaking the audience improve our numbers? Does improving the creative change things? Constantly following what I would say are the more prevalent people in the space and researching algorithm changes and staying on top of the technical side to make sure that if there is a big change, we know about it and we're adjusting things as needed. Um, I would say the biggest thing on the forefront of digital advertising in general right now, whether it's social media or paid ads or SEO is AI. Um, a lot of clients that we're talking to now, like that's a primary driver of the conversation. It's like, well, what about AI? Shouldn't we just be completely leaning into AI? Um, and we utilize AI for some random things um, when they will help. But even Google now is shifting their Google algorithm for SEO to place more emphasis on websites that are writing original content, like human driven content and kind of hurting you in certain aspects of SEO for just blasting out a ton of AI based content. Um, legislation might be changing, requiring you to disclose if content was written by AI. So like a lot of that is changing and I don't think it's ever going to be as simple as like AI is the answer. It's, AI can be a tool to help people like me do their job more effectively and target more effectively. And there are some features within these platforms where we use AI for some random audiences and sometimes it works really well and other times it doesn't. Um, so it's a moving target, but I think just being in the role we're in, it's just something that you're always going to have to stay on top of. You know, it's, it's always going to be changing. And if you're not changing with it, you're going to fall behind the curve. So but the nice thing is that's our job to learn, not our <laughs> clients, right? Like yep. it's right. even overwhelming for us. Yeah. And you start talking to some of our clients that are focused on like product development and growing their brand image and day-to-day -day business operation. They don't have any idea of the stuff we're looking into, but luckily we're in there every day trying to position their stuff as best as possible, whether it's emails, paid ads, SEO, you name it. So Kind of talk about, because uh, I think you guys cover both sides of this from what you've said. You have this whole uh, really technical side of SEO requirements and uh, updating content on the side and, and making sure that's what Google wants to see. But then you've got the creative side of it, right? You, it, the, the site still has to be pretty. The, the site you know, still has to, to look like it was made in 2024 and not 2014. <laughs> yeah. uh, so how did... How do you do that balancing act? I mean, you can't just uh, you can't just jump dump a, a giant blog on the the homepage to to get the uh, to get the characters there. How does that work? Yeah, so I think it, it always needs to be a balance, especially when you're looking at like website optimization and SEO. Um, if your website doesn't look good, your bounce rates can increase. If it's not easy to navigate, your bounce rates can increase. You need to set your website up for a good purchase conversion window first and foremost, and then address SEO alongside that. So 
there's a lot you can do from a speed optimization standpoint to make your website load faster that is going to help there's things you can do just to make sure your website's properly crawled and indexed in google's eyes and people are able to find your pages there's on-page optimization with product listings to make sure that people are going to find you in search results that it just takes time updating meta titles and descriptions and alt text and um, so there's a ton of on-page website stuff that will correspond directly, but like you still need your website to look nice and that, that is important. Um, we've actually told a couple clients, we don't want to run ads for you until you redo your website. Cause they're, they won't convert. Like they, <laughs> people will land on your website and they're not going to buy anything cause it's that bad. Yeah. And it's our job to kind of know those, the ins and outs of like, what does this menu navigation look like or how many clicks is it going to take to actually make a purchase on your website? And what easy tweaks can we make to improve conversion rate optimization and then still have SEO on the forefront of our mind if our client wants us to do that for them? You know, some clients are like, no, don't do SEO. We'll do that. You just manage our campaigns. Other clients only want help with SEO or only want help with email marketing. So that's where it just is important to have those conversations with each individual person. Um, so that's hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, and that kind of leads me to the next question. You know, some people want different things. What um, what size companies are you you guys is adventure driven working with? I mean, because you've got uh, you've got companies that you know maybe have a few dozen employees. I don't know, like uh, you know C four and CBI and that kind of thing. Yep. Uh, and then there's a lot of companies in this uh, community that are real mom and pop, real you know kind of family businesses handful of employees that uh, are oftentimes uh, as we as customers see, they're the ones that need the most help on uh, the website and understanding who their customers are and how they drive traffic to that side. Yep. So it's a big mix. Um, we have clients that only have a couple employees all the way up to several dozen employees. Um, as we were kind of coming up with our, with our business structure and doing a lot of competitive research in the market, we realized a lot of these agencies have like packages they like to kind of force clients into. And if you don't fit into their package, sorry. Um, our business motto, especially like catering towards the space we work in, which is off-road overland, has always been more like a la carte. We have different pricing packages based on how involved we are with the client based on what size campaigns we're running for the client so that the barrier to entry is a lot lower. Um, so for some of these smaller shops that just don't have the budget to spend 15 grand a month on marketing and advertising, can we do anything for you? Usually the answer is yes. Um, it still needs to make sense for both parties, right? But we've tried to position ourselves in a manner where that barrier to entry is as low as possible. So if, if there are companies that just kind of don't know where to go or don't have any direction or this part of the business is overwhelming for them that we can help them. Um, and it still makes sense. Like it's still gotta be profitable for them. Um, and at a bare minimum, we will do free audits for companies to kind of show them where they're at in an SEO standpoint or how does their social media look or, you know, if they're currently running paid ads, are they profitable? Like, You'd be surprised how many times we've got in and done an, a PPC audit for a company and been like, you lost eight grand over the last six months. And they're like, what? <laughs> um, because their agency doesn't tell them that, you know? Right. It's, um, so yeah, it, it, it really is all over the board. Um, I will say the one thing that we don't do, and it's, it's kind of on purpose, is a, a bunch of content creation. Um, a lot of agencies want to bring all that into house and there's some value in that. But what our experience has been is for the most part, a lot of these brands don't have an issue with getting content. Like they're working with ambassadors, you know, a lot of them are running their own social media. They have assets. It's the technical side that they don't understand and they can't afford to pay these agencies to run ads, do email marketing, run their social media and make all their content. And that's what some of these agencies want to force them into. Um, our fees usually include like taking the assets you have, making creatives. We do all the reporting, you know, like there's no setup fees. So what we try to do is just cater to the clients in the sense of give us everything you have and we will 
work our magic with it. You know, we'll, we'll be as successful as we can be with what you have. And if, if we have to offset some of that and do a little bit of content creation, we have the capability to do that. If we need to do some product photography or whatever it is, but I think a lot of people like to force the content creative side onto clients because that's how they make a lot of money. You know, they're like, Oh, if I do all your content, I can charge you eight grand a month. And these companies are just like, Hey, Grant, like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and that's and that's really sad, right? Because especially uh, in in our niche, uh, these outside firms that you know they're they're working with a hundred different types of companies that they, they don't understand uh, when a guy's looking for a high clearance rear bumper. They don't know what that target market looks like. Yeah, they don't understand the audience, but they don't even understand the product. Like they love that too. <laughs> getting in and doing some of these audits on these agencies that have positioned products incorrectly is just kind of a bummer to see you know the from the ad copy the text of the ads or some of the email copy that they've sent out just not fully understanding the product or the demographic um, and sometimes that makes a difference on whether a campaign is successful or completely tanks and like you said they it's easy to throw around fancy marketing words and make it sound like your God's gift to earth, but it's, <laughs> it's another thing to like have your client's best interests in mind and like want them to succeed. Right. Like actually care about the value you're bringing. Um, not just adding another client onto the, the payroll. So, well, I, I think it's exciting and, uh, uh, we wish you the, the best of luck with it. I think there is definitely, um, there, there is a need there. Uh, I, I've, worked and spoken with enough uh, manufacturers specifically in, in this space that uh, they, they need someone like you that not only understands the ins and outs technically, but but can speak the same language uh, on, on the product and the service. So uh, if you're watching this, uh, reach out to Wes. I'm sure he'll be glad to talk to you any way you want to reach out to him. What is the uh, the new official website? I'll put it up on the, the screen. Yeah, so adventuredrivenmedia.com. Adventure Driven Media. That's a good domain. That was good. Yeah. We didn't want to do adventuredrivenmediaco.com. It just felt like that <laughs> yeah, was a little, you know, um, yeah. that's going to confuse the boomers aren't going to be able to figure that one out. Right? <laughs> Is it .co.com? What, what's yeah. happening? <laughs> <laughs> so there's, like, there's a form on our website. If you want to fill it out, we'll get an email. We, we'll get in contact with you. Um, awesome. Awesome. And Is again, that where we, I submit roasts too? Or? <laughs> I'll see it. I'll see it. <laughs> Uh, all right before yeah, we let you, you uh let you go Wes, we, we've got to run through our our rapid fire uh questions yeah, this questions. week so hit, hit him john if black hills builds had a mascot what would it be oh, dude that's the one question that i was like reading through these i'm like i have, <laughs> I have no idea um <laughs> what i came up with is being that i'm in the black hills I was like, could it be Mount Rushmore? No, uh, who wants like George Washington as a mascot? It'd probably be like a bison, like okay, thick yeah. bison. Like throw some bead locks on him. You know what I mean? <laughs> I like that bison yeah. wheel drive. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, new GX five fifty or the new Land Cruiser. This is this was the easiest five fifty all day. I'm in the um, same boat. Yeah, we're all for in here. powertrain alone. Like for me, well, one aesthetically, I think they look better. But like the fact you can get a V6, yeah, like, yeah, that's a no-brainer. Like yeah. I, it kind of blew my mind that that was an offering for the GX and not the Lancers. Well, it, I Where think it, it, confu out? it confused thousands of people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, no idea what they were thinking there. Uh, I mean, I get the price difference, but like, it's not even that much. Nah. Like, for getting that much better of a powertrain, that much better specs, like right out of the gate. Uh, yeah, GX all day. Yeah. I was actually just showing one to my wife the other day. I was like, hey, babe. <laughs> yeah. That, that no over, over trail is sharp. Yeah. She's got a Sienna right now. So, like, dude, same. What year? <laughs> what is it? It's a 15. Nice. So if, for any of you dads out there, once you get to three kids, here's the minivan hack. You pull the middle seat out. So in the middle, you got one captain's chair, right? Set one kid in there. The other two kids go in the very back. And then you just have this huge cavitation of space where you can, the kids can get out and run around. We have like a travel porta potty 
Freaking amazing. Slap, <laughs> slap that thing in there. Dogs got to load up. It's it's amazing. Yeah. So going from minivan to, I don't know. I don't think my wife could go to a GX 550 and like the space wise, she would. Nah. We'd be getting fries and too many air vents in the third row. <laughs> it wouldn't work out. You have no idea how much Amazing. this minivan conversation excites John. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I, I wish I have the same V6 as you have in the Sienna in our RAV4, and it rips. We don't have that in the 23 Sienna, but it is a hybrid, and it is all-wheel oh, drive. Yeah, so and we don't have all-wheel get, drive. It gets 36 highway. We get like 18. You yeah, know? yeah 18 it's, with, it's insane. That yeah, is insane. And the all-wheel drive is a is a an electric motor, so there's no drive shaft. It just on demand. So really, gosh, maybe <laughs> maybe I need a new Sienna though. But for what for what you pay for a new all-wheel drive Sienna, you might as well go buy a freaking GX five. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I was yeah. like, hey, why don't we just buy a Sequoia? Dude. She's like, nah, <laughs> let's get a Sienna. Well, Sienna, new Sienna is an Odyssey's now. They're just they're fully taking advantage of people. Yes. Uh, favorite brand modal, motor or gear oil? Are you a loyalist or a what's on the shelf at Walmart? Not really. In my 80, I run Valvoline, synthetic stuff, you know, oil, whatever, ATF, Valvoline, just Valvoline across the board. I've had really good with all their, really good luck with all their synthetic stuff. I've talked to so many people too on the old lane because they're just like, do you run synthetic? Do you not? <laughs> I've always ran synthetic and it's, mm-hmm been great uh it might burn off a tiny bit i think for the most part all my seals are pretty good like i don't have any noticeable oil loss between oil changes um, yeah i feel like if synthetic's gonna cause a leak you were gonna get a leak anyways yeah exactly it may have expedited it but it was gonna happen yeah for sure you catch it earlier right yeah <laughs> so no that's that's kind of what i use but not right. loyalist we'll i'll throw Whatever cheap stuff in the Sienna, or you know, <laughs> you can just quite mix, yeah. mix in coolants until it gels up. Just waiting. <laughs> um, um, which team, Wes, red or yellow? I'm I'm a Dewalt guy for sure. <sighs> that only. I mean, he's wearing a red I don't shirt. Think it <laughs> yeah. the, it started because, gosh, like eight or nine years ago out of college this would have been a couple years out of college but i finally decided like oh i should get some good tools and someone mm-hmm. gave me the the starter the pack from no dual yeah. right the drill and um little impact and i just felt like i already had the batteries you know so like every tool i've added since then it's just made sense to yeah stick with the wall i but like it i'll admit we, if if I had if if I had bought Dewalt as my first one in college, I would be a Dewalt guy because yeah. you just stick with what you've got. When I was finishing out the inside of my shop, my buddy is a Milwaukee guy, and I had my little quarter drive impact versus his, and his was ripping though. And I was looking at him <laughs> like, dude, what is wrong with this Dewalt one? Do I have like the Wish version or? So I think that's just how they come. But yeah. Oh, I- <laughs> <laughs> Milwaukee Impact, I will say, it was pretty impressive. But you know, you know, John, we need to start a, a scoreboard for this. Th- this question stays consistent with each guest, and I- I'd say we're about tied at this this point. Are you, oh, yeah. you counting yourself? Or so how many? <laughs> how many guests have been like a team Ryobi? Team. <laughs> yeah, we, that, yeah? we check that we check that in the uh in the pre-interview yeah. they don't pass <laughs> that yeah. yeah they're like sorry yeah. you can't be on the podcast yeah, anymore <laughs> yeah. Yeah. what's uh i think milwaukee is owned by the yeah. same company that owns rayobi which is scary but they're probably made in the same factory it's probably just little upgraded internals a little better battery there's a lot of that that goes on yeah yeah, yeah. Last question. One country outside the U.S. to wheel, what is it? Where is it? I'd probably have to say Australia just because of the heritage of off-road and overland coming from over there and the influence that they've had on U.S. And now I think it's coming full circle, vice versa, and like a lot of their stuff's being influenced by the crazy builds that we've had in the States because there's not as much regulation and that's sure. just – I've watched videos of their tracks and all the backcountry stuff they do. And I think their style of wheeling would be super fun. Um, I don't think the 80 would be set up well uh, by any means, but 
<laughs> it would make it like 180 miles. I'd have no spare fuel. And they'd be like, you got like, you know, 500 kilometers to the next fuel. <laughs> yeah. But uh, no, I, I love it. it. Like the whole canopy style bush country stuff that they do, like they get after it. You know, they do. Yeah, they really yeah. do. Crazy two track, like deep mud bog stuff. Like I hate mud. If there's one type of wheeling I would <laughs> never want to do again, uh, sign me mud, take it off the list just because it's such a pain to clean your vehicle afterwards. But yep. yeah, my garage is constantly yeah, dusty. Don't, don't come visit us over here on the East. Coast. Yeah. You're in the, yeah. you're in the wrong side of the country. If you want to avoid yeah. mud, that's don't like, remind me. <laughs> that is your thing. And now, that, so I, I just realized now that I cut the fenders, like there's no fender liner anymore Ooh, on the 80 yeah. and even the flares cut like the overhang of the flares cut out. Right. So it's just gut it. So I went to the Badlands for the first time after I did all that and just Badlands mud is like clay, thick, goopy. I don't even know what's in it. It turns your tires blue. Like it's weird stuff. And I just destroyed the inside of that. And I think I spent like an hour and 20 minutes and $45 at a car wash. Man, <laughs> manual Bay, just getting the nozzle and like every nook and cranny. Yeah, and- yeah, yeah. Been there. I was just like, why did I do that? It was not worth it. Every and, two minutes you're going over and putting in eight more quarters. <laughs> yeah, dude, luckily they have credit cards because it oh, was just yeah. like – But I think it, I maxed the credit card out once. I think it, it automatically shut it off after like 20, <laughs> 25 or 30 bucks. I went over there. It was just like, oh, my gosh, what am I doing with my life? <laughs> I just need to get a – it's hard because I live on a well, so I don't really want to like – Oh, I see. Well water pressure – washer i don't know yeah you can get like a you could probably get a tank from like a co-op or something or marketplace and just use that to feed it yeah that's not a bad idea it would at least our our water in our house is treated so if i could find a way to like tie our main off into the garage or something and use that water maybe that would work but for now everything outside is just like super hard iron filled water and i'm like i don't feel great about cleaning the 80 (laughs) off with that either yeah jeez All right. Well, thanks again, Wes. Uh, We sure appreciate you coming on and kind of walking us through your whole uh, whole journey here. It's funny. I mean, you went from five years ago from uh, Black Hills uh, Taco uh, starting an account. And now here you are with an uh, an entrepreneur with uh, with your own uh, digital media company. So congratulations, buddy. Thank you. It's been crazy. I appreciate you guys. It was fun. Yeah. You guys have me on and I will say the keep the the intro video because I was like, okay, what are these guys? <laughs> <laughs> As I was watching some of your guys, no, I love it. I love what you guys are doing. You guys' former episodes have been great too. So, well, awesome. thank you. Um, yeah, yeah, I really appreciate, appreciate you coming it. on. All right, Absolutely. thanks, guys. See you next time. Yeah, thanks, guys.